The following is a presentation of the Six Arrows Radio Network. Ham Radio 360 Podcast. Everything you've ever wanted to know about APRS. MTCRadio.com presents Ham Radio 360, the podcast, with your host, Kale Nelson, K4CDN. Yeah, so I, I I just start off the show here with Go Falcons. <laughs> Tim's mad. Uh, yeah, I'm pulling for the Falcons in the Super Bowl. My name's Kale. It's K4 CDN. I'm the host here, executive producer of the Ham Radio 360 podcast, all things Ham Radio 360. Really appreciate you coming in. I say it every time we start a show, every time we close a show. It, it's not a script. I don't read this stuff, guys. It's from the heart. Uh, we really appreciate you making this a part of your weekly Ham Radio edutainment yeah we like to educate and we like to entertain probably a little bit of both sometimes a little more than the other but we do our best every week as we bring these programs to you now i'm saying every week because we have a program for you every week this week it's the ham radio 360 podcast that's the mothership as george likes to call it and it's the interview type topical conversation learn about something in ham radio show with me The opposing weeks, my buddy George and Jeremy come in here and do a very deep technical discussion all about things that you're doing with or on your workbench in your ham shack. Now, I can tell you the the reason they do it is because it's way above my pay grade. And that's really cool because uh, it's great to have smart friends because smart friends can help you out when you do stupid stuff and get yourself in a bind. So make sure you check out the Workbench Show. It'll be here next Tuesday. And we hope that uh, not only listening, uh, that you're sharing this program. I hear a lot of podcasters begging you to leave reviews and begging you to subscribe to their show. I just want you to listen and enjoy it. And if you do enjoy it, please tell somebody about it. That's the best thing you could do for us here. Really appreciate you sharing this show with your friends. Speaking of friends, how about our friends down at Paris, Texas? Main Trading Company, mtcradio.com, show sponsor, been with us for a very long time. Best prices online for Kenwood Radio Gear, whether it's the brand new Tri-Band Handy Talkie, maybe you're looking at a 590 SG for a a really nice flagship rig to put there, maybe the 990 if you want the big dog. They've got everything from Kenwood and the best prices online. If you're looking for some Kenwood gear, make sure you check out my friends Richard and Christine down at mtcradio.com. And while we haven't changed our intro yet, we're working on that. While while that hasn't happened yet, I cannot get by the introduction without telling you that uh, we are now sponsored very proudly by our friends at Elacraft.com. Yep, Elacraft, the makers of the KX2, KX3, the K3S, the K1, all of those great radios can be found at Elacraft.com. One of our show sponsors here, very excited to welcome them into the family of HamRadio360.com. If you're looking for some adventure radio gear, yeah, it's Elacraft, Elacraft.com. So it's, it's really no shock to anyone that's been around a while that Facebook is probably my least favorite social media platform, while as Twitter is my favorite. And uh, the reason being is because Facebook is just so dramatic, especially now. And uh, I'm just not trying to go there with my ham stuff. So I really, really like Twitter. Although it's, I mean, it's, it's a mess right now too. But anyway, a few months ago, I was tweeting about uh, or lamenting on Twitter about my, my lack of success with APRS. And, and there was a guy who came in and was asking, well, what's the problem? What are you doing wrong? <laughs> Of course, because it is, and it was me. Yeah, it it was uh, at KWF. It's Kenneth Finnegan, and uh, we we kind of uh, talked a little bit offline about what was going on. And then uh, he said, hey, can I can I just help you? Can you call me on the phone? And I said, sure. He gave me his phone number. I called him one evening, like two hours later. I asked him, I said, can I, can I have you come on the show and help me, help my audience understand this APRS thing? And he said, sure. So uh, back before Christmas, we got together. I've been sitting on this one for a while. We had the Winter Field Day show. We had the uh, Napoto follow-up. Uh, but I did not want to let us get too far into the new year without this one. So, Kenneth, thank you very much again for coming in. Uh, Kenneth has helped me off the show, uh, spent some time with me. 
helping me learn about APRS. And at that point, about four minutes into that conversation, I immediately knew that we needed to have this guy on the show to talk to us about APRS. We have had so many questions raised over the last three years about what is APRS? What will APRS do for me? Why do I want APRS? Is it just a GPS tracking device? Blah, blah, blah. We've had them all and we've, we've tried to answer them. But the fact of the matter is, it still seems to be a very complicated uh, thing out there in the ham universe, but really it's not. And the more I'm learning about it, the more I'm understanding that it's really not that complicated. And in large part, thanks to folks like Kenneth, who has come along and said, hey, let me help you with this. And so, Kenneth, we want to get, welcome you into the Ham Radio 360 podcast and look forward to learning from you this morning. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Kel. Absolutely, man. Guys, uh, Kenneth's called us Whiskey 6, Kilo Whiskey Fox, and he resides out in uh, Sunnyvale, California. He knows Ed Fong, and he knows yeah. some of the guys of, uh, of the Baynet group. He actually heard about the 360 podcast at Pacificon. Can you kind of give us just an idea about what Pacificon really is for people that have never got to attend that event? Yeah, sure. So Pacificon is kind of one of the West Coast Division amateur radio conferences. And so we set up uh, out in the East Coast and it's got several lecture tracks as well as it's, there's a I think there's a full day ham cram session. There's test sessions, vendor booths, kind of your typical it, I would say it's like one or two notches above your typical um, kind of ham fest sort of flea market thing. Cool, cool. So you can buy stuff there, but you can but, also oh, inter- yeah. inter- you can interact with uh, with with people that are in the hobby as well as manufacturers and learn and participate in forums and whatnot. Oh yeah, so like I, I actually spoke at it this year. So I gave a cool. one hour lecture on um, d- the communications network that I deploy for a wildflower, the wildflower triathlon. Yeah. And so I talked about spinning up about half a dozen UHF repeaters. Which I've seen one of the videos about that. And we're going to link that in our show notes, Kenneth, because that's a very intriguing, actually that's what got me pushed further toward Kenneth when I was looking for some help on APRS. Uh, he makes it sound really easy. And beyond that, the, the scope of work you guys do for that particular event is amazing. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, I'm just going to encourage folks to watch the video. It'll be in the show notes, and you guys really need to check it out. It, there's a lot of great information there. And, and not to mention that Kenneth has over 200 YouTube videos as well on his channel. So, oh, I, I don't think I have that many. I think I only have about uh, 100 and change. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I, I misspoke. Uh, a yeah, few yeah. over 100. Okay, so, hey, yeah. maybe he'll have 200 this time next year. You know, he's a, he's a oh, we can we can only hope. Yeah. We can only hope. Yeah. So what we're here to chat about this time through is APRS, and you know a lot of people right off the hip they get it wrong. They call it automatic position system reporting system, and uh, it's it's really it didn't start out about being about position systems, did it? I mean, it it started out about packet. Well, no, it, it, well, I would say that it really did. Okay. Um, so the kind of the, the history of the naming for it, um, right? So. Packet radio became a thing in 1981 when the FCC um, a- allowed amateurs to start playing with it. Um, and so during the during the 1980s, uh, Bob Bernanga, WB4APR, um, was working on this concept of location tracking over amateur radio. Um, and so he actually took his call sign and backronymed it into the automatic position reporting system. Right, and so okay. it was originally called the automatic position reporting system. Okay, um, but as the concept of APRS grew, and it became more than just a automatic tracking system, and became this much more of this local situational awareness system, where you can report not only your location but your status and your telemetry and what frequency you're listening to. Um, he he renamed it to being the automatic packet reporting system. So it's not only positions, but everything else. Okay, so um, it's, that, it's kind of gone back to its beginnings, really, with how it's used nowadays. Yeah, right. And so um, it's one of those things where if someone calls it the automatic position reporting system, I won't correct them because they're not really wrong. Um, because the lion's share of the use of it is just for vehicle tracking. Um, but... I, I personally call it the automatic packet reporting system. Okay, okay. And in what you said there, already we've got folks confounded when, when we're talking about uh, showing situational awareness for our, for our local area of operations, uh, showing telemetry and, and our position as well. You know, it APRS to me, it seems, it, at the first blush, it seems so complicated, but at the very end, 
it's such a simplistic system. And I think it's because as amateurs, we think that it's so much more than it really is because it'll do a lot. So oh, in yeah. our, in our minds, we make it harder than it really has to be. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the objective of APRS, the killer app for it is the concept that if you were to have some sort of event or a disaster or even just in day-to-day -day life, if you were to take an amateur radio operator and drop him out of the sky into an area, he, within about 10 minutes, he should be able to, over APRS, collect all of the local situational information on where are the local repeaters, where are the local other hams, um, where is the command center for this event, where is the local rest stops, where is supply caches. Um, the concept of APRS is that you can advertise all of these different local resources on this one national frequency so that anyone else passing through can listen on that frequency and just become aware of it. Which would be really cool if we kind of did it that way instead of just kind of doing all these other things that some of it's like that and some of it's not and some of it fits and some of it doesn't. It's, it's a perpetual dream, right? We can, <laughs> we can always hope to get there. Well, the, the, one of the questions I get asked all the time is, yeah. why in the world would I want to invest in APRS? Uh, what are some of the sensibilities and the good reasonings behind participating in that aspect of the hobby? Well, that really depends what you're trying to do, right? And so I, I use APRS quite a bit for event support. And so um, uh, hams that invest in their own APRS equipment um, are much easier or mu are much more useful respondents to like like working for a parade or something um, because – we don't, as as an event, um, you know, as event staff, I then don't need to get APRS equipment installed in their vehicles, and during the event, I can follow them around and see them. Um, in a data in a day to day um, uh, day to day operations, it's I would say that APRS is really kind of interesting because uh, it lets you see the other people around you. And so, like, for example, if you're watching an APRS on your second radio, um, you can see a new ham pop up who's saying, hey, I'm listening on you know, 146.52. And so you don't need to be listening to 146.52 and all four local repeaters. You can see someone just pop up on APRS and you can go, oh, hey, I, I can, you know, QSY over and talk to that person. Um, personally, I actually use it quite a bit when I'm uh, like off-roading and camping is because APRS, um, all, a whole bunch of the traffic for it gets gatewayed to the internet. And so even though my, my mom isn't a ham, I can give her a link to say, hey, if you want to know where, where I am, just look at this link. And so if my parents ever get worried while I'm out camping, they can just look at, oh, hey, look, Kenneth's truck just moved an hour ago, so he's fine. <laughs> well, you know, that, that's the thing about it. Um, it does a lot. It really will do a lot. And there's a pretty minimal investment of equipment that's required. I mean, you can go from anything – cheap handy talking a bluetooth tnc to it even now they've got uh cables that connect an android phone to a, a handy talkie and, and you can eye gate there um and that's a term whoa i just just threw out an acronym or at least a word that that may that people may not know about um and, and there's almost like a whole glossary that goes along with the uh the hobby of aprs um you know one of the terms that gets kicked around a lot is eye gate can you kind of give us an idea about what an eye gate does well, sure. Let's let's talk about the whole APRS infrastructure. Okay. Um, so, at at the endpoints of the of the APRS network, you have what are called um, trackers or nodes, right? And so these are the this is the radio that you put in your truck, or this is the the base station that you have set up with your computer, um, and they're the endpoints that you where you're trading information between. Uh, the problem is that since APRS is on this one frequency, it's a simplex network. And Simplex doesn't have as great a range as repeater systems, right? I mean, anyone that's tried to use Simplex suffers from this. Yeah. Um, and so APRS has what are called digipeaters or digital repeaters that they sit on mountaintops or on high towers or on the top of people's houses. And they just listen for any packets coming in. And when they hear packets from a nearby station, they will repeat it again on the same frequency, right? And so you've now bounced from wherever you are down in a valley up to the nearest mountaintop and gotten retransmitted from there. Um, so that's how you kind of, on the local RF side, can propagate outwards a couple hops through these digipeters. Mm -hmm. um, 
as you are propagating outwards, you're going to be passing by these other stations called internet gateways. And what they are is they are a APRS node that is also connected to the internet. And through that node, um, they, any packets they receive, they will gateway you onto the APRS IS system, the APRS internet system. Um, and this is just the fire hose of every APRS packet in the entire world that's been heard by one of these internet gateways that come together and um, just are available online for your perusal. Yeah, and uh, it doesn't take a whole lot to get there, but you do have to uh, you have to be heard <laughs> through yeah. either RF or by a device that is set up as an internet gateway. Exactly. That's what happened to me. You know, I, we had Rob Riggs on one of the early shows back in season one of Ham Radio. Well, actually, then it was Photon Time Podcast. But we had Rob Riggs on. Great conversation, man. He's he's building this TNC2, which we'll link in the, in the show notes. It's a great show. We'll have the link there as well. Uh, and he's talking about this device. And I'm like, I have got to get one of these because this has got to be one of the coolest things I've ever heard of in my life. And I get yeah. one and I get it I get it running and I'm testing it. And I'm like, oh, it's squawking. It's working. And I'd go in and go to APRS.FI and try to find myself and it would never show and i'm like it's busted it's a piece of crap <laughs> but that wasn't that that was not the case actually do not think that that's a piece of crap it's really a great little piece of equipment but it has to be heard by someone who can either digipeat it or repeat it to another station that can then get it in touch with the internet or it has to be heard by one of those stations on the front end here in spartanburg south carolina we have two digipeters in the county one is my fill-in at my parents house another is a kate hid up in the top end of the county which is a long way from here so that's why we weren't i wasn't being heard it's just there was nobody to hear me it wasn't an equipment problem it was just a lack of uh lack of technology in the county to be able to hear me so oh sure that, and that was my introduction to aprs as well um is i was i first got intro introduced to it back when i was at um during graduate school down at california polytechnic in San Luis Obispo. And so I install a tracker in my pickup truck and I'm driving home back up to the Bay Area, right? And it's a three hour drive. And so I'm, I'm driving north from San Luis Obispo. I hit the top of the grade and I'm, I look, I'm looking at my, uh, the, the plot of my um, drive afterwards. I hit the top of the grade north of San Luis and I disappear <laughs> for an hour and a half, just gone. And then all of a sudden you just magically reappear and there's a straight line across curvy roads and mountainous terrain. Exactly. It's yeah. like this hundred miles of California, you, you just hopped over it. Yeah, it was one um, of those Star Trek things there. Yeah, right. And that was <laughs> and that that's the, the central coast of California, which is kind of this notorious dead zone that we've got mm. um centered around King City. And this and so this this that that experience really got me interested in APRS and well what really is kind of going on here right. and so King King City has been my white whale for the last four years trying to figure out like I'm literally I, I'm I'm calling people in King City saying hey do you have a spare antenna hanging up can I come <laughs> install an eye gate at your house <laughs> and so really, hey if, if yeah yeah, yeah and if you, so if anyone any listeners live in King City and are willing to provide me power and internet I'll come install a Digipeter uh, eye gate at your house. He's good on QRC, by the way. Exactly. Yeah, look him up, Whiskey 6, Kilo Whiskey. I'm sorry. Yeah, Whiskey 6, Kilo Whiskey Fox. His name is yep. Kenneth Finnegan, and we'll be back with uh, Kenneth here in just a minute as we continue our conversation about APRS. Hi, Dan, KB6NU here. Whether you're studying for your tech license or looking to upgrade to general or extra, you should check out my no-nonsense amateur radio license study guides. Written in my easy-to-understand, no-nonsense style, they really are the easiest way to learn what you need to know to pass the test. And they are always up to date. The PDF version of the Technician Class Study Guide is free on my website at kb6nu.com slash podcast. And all my study guides are available in print, PDF, Kindle, and EPUB versions. Let me help you have more fun with ham radio. Go to kb6nu.com slash podcast and get started today. So we're, we're back with uh, Kenneth Finnegan. His call is Whiskey 6 Kilo Whiskey Fox. He is from Sunnyvale, California, and he's helping me and you learn about APRS, the Automatic Packet Reporting System. And, uh, man, just the, the first segment was great, learning about uh, some of the, the terms there and why sometimes it works around where we live and why sometimes it doesn't. Uh, 
what are some other things that we need to consider if we're new into this? Um, maybe some experiences you had learning coming into this as a new ham. Well, I mean, getting into APRS, kind of the hardest question you got to ask yourself is really what what do you want to do with it? Um, a lot of people, including kind of including me, um, are perfectly happy primarily using APRS as just a vehicle tracking system, right? So where is my pickup truck right now? Um, and so really kind of what you end up wanting to do with it really dictates what sort of different gear you're going to be getting and installing um, for the APRS experience. Um when you're looking at just tracking, um, there's v- various different levels of what are called trackers that you can install in your um, vehicles to support APRS, right? And so on on the kind of the high end, the Primo Deluxe experience, um, both Yezu and Kenwood actually sell mobile rigs that have APRS built into them. So, I mean, many people have APRS in their car and they don't even know it. <laughs> Right. Lucky, and lucky so, dogs. Yeah, right. So um like the the Kenwood 710 is kind of I think one of the one of the premier amateur radio off the shelf um experiences. And so on the on the LCD, um I think you just hold one of the buttons and it'll switch you over into APRS mode and then you can from there, you know, type in what your status message is. Um it'll show you any nearby stations that are on APRS. Um you can actually type in and receive text messages over APRS and so um, the 710 supports that. Um, then you can go down to the low end where you don't want to have any of this interaction at all and you just want to do vehicle tracking. And at that point, you're looking at um, uh, stuff like the Bionics MicroTrack AIO or all-in-one that's literally just a little orange Pelican case that you stick AA batteries in it and it has a GPS receiver in it. It has the radio in it. It's got an antenna connector. You just screw on an antenna and then you're good to go. Um, And so it really depends on where you want to fall in that spectrum. Personally, I kind of go in the middle um, where I take a spare mobile rig radio and I wire it up to what is called a TNC or terminal node controller. And this is kind of what we call modems in APRS land. Okay. All right. So the the TNC or terminal node controller, that term dates back from the 80s when we were just getting started in packet radio. Um, because at that point, the concept of hooking the computer up to some packet network was just, it wasn't a thing. I mean, n- almost no one had computers. Um, and so they uh, were building these things called terminal node controllers, where the concept was you're hooking it up to your um, dumb virtual terminal, right, or your line printer. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that name has just kind of stuck. So when you hear people talking about their TNCs, they're talking about little boxes that are you know, have a radio modem interface on one side and have a serial port or a USB port on the other side. Okay. And and this is what you do in your car. Yeah. So in, in my car, I've got a Motorola, um, Motorola, uh, commercial radio that I have programmed to just one frequency. I've got it on the 144.39 megahertz APRS frequency. Um, it sits underneath my driver's seat and on the top of it strapped to it with zip ties. I've got this little, uh, TNC from Argent Data. It's called the OT3M. Um, and so it's got a D, uh, D-sub connector on the back of it with a little audio cable running to the radio. And then from the serial port, I've got it plugged into a magnetic mount GPS antenna that sits on the top of my pickup. Right. And so if you look at my pickup truck, you'll see two 19-inch whips on it. One of them's for my voice radio and the other one's for this APRS tracker. And then I've got a magnetic GPS antenna stuck to the side of it. Now, uh, just I want to stop you there real quick. Um, I know that uh, two meters is crazy in the Bay Area, and yeah. uh, four forty is is pretty hopping as well. Two twenty is exciting. Uh, do you get any interference across the top of your truck if you're trying to talk on a a lower frequency um, two meter repeater, or, or, or say on five two or anything like that? Do you when it's oh yeah, do you get any any crossover there? Yeah, it's one of those. I I regret putting both of the antennas on the top of my pickup truck. Okay. Um, you know, in an ideal world, um, if you actually use v- VHF voice communications, you're really going to want to put this second antenna um, much farther away um, than just um, you know a couple feet away on top of my truck. Okay. Um, that being said, um, in the Bay Area, yeah, VHF is hopping, UHF is hopping. We have no repeater pairs left, <laughs> right? Is we we're fully booked up here. 
And so I actually tend to stick um, almost all of the repeaters I want to talk on have both VHF and UHF inputs. And so I'll typically stick to the UHF side um, of the repeater. And so that, you know, on the VHF side, I don't have to deal with randomly, you know, the conversation dropping out right. um, whenever my tracker happens to beacon. Just, um, but yeah, that, that is a problem. And I will, if, if I get into a good conversation on VHF, I'll typically just turn off the tracker for a few minutes. Okay. Because it's right there under your seat. You just reach down, turn the knob, it's over. Yeah, I've got a little switch down by my radio. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, that was just a question I thought I'd toss in there because that's something, you know, someone may have not considered until they have drilled a hole in their roof. And uh, it may be one of those instances that p- potentially a uh, a front fender mount or a rear deck mount or something might be a little bit better location for your APRS tracker. Oh, yeah. And it's one of those things where, depending on how much power you're running, you're really kind of doing a good stress test on your two front ends. Right, right. A lot of um, decents so I, available there. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you've got it running in your truck, and you're tracking virtually everywhere you go. You're not trying to send messages through this, this uh, Motorola commercial radio rig. You're just you're just plotting yourself for your friends and family and fellow hams to follow you along. Um you said the Kenwood Kenwood radio could message. You could send messages. Uh, I, I'm assuming that, and I I'm, I'm, I say that I'm assuming. I know what it is. I'm asking for our listeners. Um, that's just like a point to point text message, right? Yeah. So um, I mean, APRS supports many different data formats, right? So not only does it support locations, but it supports these messages where you can, from your station, send send out a packet and say, um, you know, send this packet to this other specific station and here is a relatively short you're limited to like 67 characters Mm -hmm. um here is a 67 character long text message that i would like them to receive right and it actually the the network supports acknowledgement so that when you send it out you can make sure the other person got it because they will acknowledge it back um and so and so your radio will actually keep sending it Every you know, every few minutes until it gets an acknowledgement back saying, "Okay, I got it." Like you can stop now. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you this: because in the in today's society, I mean, we're a text messaging society like mad. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that used often a lot uh, with amateurs, or are they just going to their iPhones now instead? Oh, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, it's I mean, it's it's not going to be anywhere near as good as your iPhones, right? Yeah. But um, when you're out um, in uh, you're, and you, you're driving along and you see someone new. I mean, oh, so when you're passing, when you're driving along and your passenger sees someone new, cause you're not using the radio this right, involved right. while you're driving, um, your passenger can sit there and go, Oh, Hey, someone just popped up. And all you know about them is their call sign, right? All that's shown up is, you know, their call sign, then maybe like a dash four or something, okay. um, which is the, se- uh, which is the secondary station ID. Um, and so if you see, you'll see a lot of call signs with these numbers after that. And all it means is that, um, on RF, you can have 16 different stations with just your call sign, wow. and it's just a it's just a ser- serial number, right? And so okay. I have a you know my pickup truck is W6KWF-1. My uh, desktop computer at home is W6KWF with no numbers after it. Um, my the digit the digital repeater in my uh, apartment's lab is a W6KWF-15, right? So I just pick different numbers for all of them. Okay. Um, so as you're driving along, all you know about this person is their call sign. And so you can sit right there and type out a text message to them. Hey, um, you know, what frequency you're on or, hey, you know, all of us are hanging out on this repeater. Like, come you know, check us out. Mm-hmm. Um, where it really becomes valuable and where I use it a lot is once you get past cell phone coverage. Mm. Right. Because APRS is on VHF mm-hmm. at, you know, t- uh, 10 or 20 or 30 watts where cell phones are, you know, only one watt and much, much higher frequencies. Right. And so I can be out in the middle of sticks nowhere. I mean, King City is kind of the counter example, but I can be out in sticks nowhere, have APRS coverage and no cell phone coverage. Mm. Right. And so this is where those internet gateways become real interesting because there's people that run servers online that are just hooked up to this fire hose that is all of the APRS traffic that listen for messages to these gateways they set up to text messages for cell phones, email. Um, And so, like, I was actually, uh, several years ago, I went to the Burning Man Festival out in the Nevada desert. No cell phone coverage out there. But Nevada has a great APRS community. They've they've built a fantastic APRS network across Nevada. And so I'm sitting in my pickup truck parked 
at Burning Man. And I'm able to type out, um, I hooked up a computer to this tracker underneath my uh, driver's seat, and I was able to type out emails to my parents saying, hey, I arrived, I'm fine, like everything's good, um, see you in a week. <laughs> so instead of Winlink, you're using IPRS. Yeah. Okay. Right. And it, it, it's it's a short you know shorter shorter form messages. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So you know, like the email they got was essentially just a subject line. Yeah. Um, I'm alive. But, right. But when you're out in the middle of nowhere and you need to get a message to someone, that's really all you need. Yeah. Uh, let's say you were hurt somewhere and you were able to track your coordinates and you could send yeah. that. You know. Right. And so like all all week, my parents would you know open up the browser and go, oh hey, you know, not that my parents are that micromanaging, but they they were really fascinated with this concept of me going out in the middle of the desert with seventy thousand other people. Um. <laughs> And so it was reassuring to them to see, oh, look, Kenneth's truck is still there and his battery voltage is at 12.3 volts, so he's fine. <laughs> he's going to make it home. Yeah. That's right. pretty cool, man. Yeah. Well, th- there's still a lot to talk about APRS. I mean, we just we just just touched on tracking, and uh, there's even more to it than that. And I want to continue the conversation here in just a few moments, if we can. We're talking with Kenneth Finnegan. He is from Sunnyvale, California. His call is Whiskey 6 Kilo Whiskey Fox. You want to make sure you check out his video links in the show notes. There's a lot of great information there, and we're going to continue to learn with him as we come back here in just a moment. ICOM continues to bring innovation to amateur radio like the number one selling HF rig in the world. It's the ICOM IC7300. Maybe you don't need a big, huge SDR with knobs. Maybe you're looking for a solid, well-built, well-defined, really, really nice dual-band handy talkie. Let me refer you over to the ICOM ID51. Yeah, Richard has those two at mtcradio.com. If you're looking for ICOM gear, visit my friends, mtcradio.com. And we're back with Kenneth Finnegan. Thanks again, Kenneth, for being here. You know, we've talked about APRS, why we would may want to play there, uh, what it would possibly take or what type of things you need to have in place before it works good, even how to follow yourself around in your car if you're interested in tracking your position. But, you know, I think that there's still a lot of people out there that visit the APRS websites that look up APRS on YouTube or in some of the Yahoo groups. And they're just still confused by it all. Why does it? Why does this have to be so confusing? Well, that's a good question. That's kind of one of one of the down pitfalls of APRS is um, Bob Bernango when he originally developed it. Um, he came up with this genius idea um, because at the time, you know, in the in the late eighties and the early nineties, that was the end of the bulletin board packet system, right? Because during the eighties, we had this huge nationwide bulletin board system that was. Um, phenomenally valuable versus what at that time was the bulletin boards for the internet because you didn't have to tie up your phone line. Um, fast forward to the 90s, AOL is becoming a thing, internet's becoming a thing. Um, everyone's got these terminal node controllers that are no longer really being useful and they're just kind of sitting on the shelf. So um, Bob Bernanga's kind of real breakthrough for APRS was this idea that he designed the protocol so that you could just take the existing terminal node controllers, fiddle with a few of the settings in them, and they became APRS nodes. Um, and so it was this very kind of clever hack layered on top of um, the existing hardware that just happened to be sitting around. Um, then the next generation of TNCs come out, and they kind of have to figure out, well, what's the layer of hacks that we can do on top of this one to support the same sort of messaging? Um, and then... It's just kind of been this 25-year evolution where we've always kind of not really been able to design the protocol so much as um, kind of figure out how to make the protocol work with what we happen to have. Mm. And so it's been this long, organic kind of duct tape on top of duct tape sort of growth that kind of makes for a very confusing, hairy ball of a protocol um, which over the decades has had several different kind of generations to it that we can never really say, well, all right, this feature is deprecated because people still use that feature. Um, and so it's kind of always been this large, hairy ball of kind of confusion. <laughs> and I can speak from personal experience that, that has what, that's what it has felt like to me, uh, even to the point where I've asked questions in Yahoo groups and would just get this answer basically to the to the effect of, well, you should know how to. You should know what we're talking about. Um, almost like, since you're a licensed amateur, you should have the same experience that I have over 35 years of experience of playing with terminal node controllers. When it's 
just go read this, and this is about 17 pages long that you have to scroll through that began in 1997, and you're still reading updates in 2016. That It can be very overwhelming, very frustrating. And, and like I've told you many times, Kenneth, I've been ready to quit numerous times. <laughs> but the investment, although it's minimal that I've made, it, it's still an investment, and, and I just haven't wanted to let it go. Yeah, sure. And and and, it, and if and it's that that confusion that has got to be just a, this hazing that we do for new new hams getting into amateur <laughs> uh, getting into the APRS system. Um so if if you're feeling that confusion, embrace it. It means that you're paying attention. Okay. Um and I had the exact same experience, right? Is so my my formative, you know, my my introduction to APRS was I put the tracker in my pickup, I drove north out of San Luis Obispo, dropped off the face of the earth for 2 hours. So I then come back and I'm sitting there and going, you know, well, what went wrong? Like what, you know, what, what could I have changed? And so I start, I start researching it, right? Cause at that point I'm in college, I've got all the time in the world and no money <laughs> as any good college student does. And so I start looking into it and it, it just, you know, layer after layer of this and I'm going, oh my God, like, you know, how have we gotten here 25 years later? Mm -hmm. um, and so at that point I, I happened to also just be kind of looking for, my master's thesis topic, right? As I was a master's student at Cal Poly. And so I actually decided to do it on APRS. And so I shopped around the department and I found a graduate advisor that, you know, I'm, I'm, I sit down and I explained to her, I'm like, all right, I want to do it on this 30 year old 1200 bit per second packet network, right? And this is in 2013. And so she's sitting there and she's looking at it going like, well, um, I'm not an amateur radio operator. Almost nothing that you said means anything to me, um, right? I don't know what this terminal node controller thing is you keep talking about, but you know it sounds like an interesting project. So what the hell? Let's do it, <laughs> right? And so then for the rest of my committee, I managed to round up all the all the rest of the licensed professors um, in our department, and so I went. And I did my master's thesis on APRS. That's when you know you're serious about it, folks. Yeah, right. Um, so. <laughs> I, I now have a master's degree from Cal Poly. Um, my master's thesis, thesis, thesis topic was examining the ambiguities in the automatic packet reporting system. It didn't. It didn't end up. It's it's about seventy pages long. It didn't end up being this kind of great solution to it. But I spent a lot of time digging through all of these old archives and trying to figure out not so much what all the answers were because trying to answer all of the questions, design questions for a packet network is really much more beyond the scope of trying to just get a master's degree. But I looked at, well, what do we not know? Like what questions do, do the next five grad students doing their master's thesis on APRS need to ask? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of tidbits and stuff in this um, document that I ended up writing. It's not a, it, I wouldn't say that it is the, the handbook for APRS, but anyone trying to get into APRS that's read a few of the mailing lists and stuff, um, it's a great place to then go and see a lot more of these kind of tidbits collected together. All in one spot, all written within the last five years. And yeah. Yeah. But, and you know, I really want to just love and embrace this technology because here's the, here's the fact of the matter. And I've said this on the show before, I'm going to say it again. Uh, you know, we really, really want to be able to have this type of connectivity in, in this County to be able to, uh, share messaging back and forth, uh, to have it in case of an emergency, to use it for uh, different events that the local clubs participate in. But there's just nothing nothing built here for that. And, and the brick walls that I find are always built by other amateurs who just kind of automatically assume you know exactly what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah that's, for, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. So I, I appreciate you writing. I've got a copy. I've I've looked at it. I haven't really taking the time to study it yet, but I will because I, I am looking to continue to be educated on this. It's, uh, to me, I think it's really cool. And you know, it's just one of those things and you say things in quotation marks, uh, that's a, another avenue of the hobby that a lot of people don't understand. So they read a little bit about it on one of the websites, scares them to death. They go the other direction and to never experience what it could really do for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, and, and at the same time, everybody's like, oh, well, that's just GPS tracking. I've got that on my phone. So that's the other attitude that you get. Um, you utilize APRS on uh, 
on some of the things that you do uh, regarding some of the volunteer gigs with your local community and the amateur radio there and some, some runs and whatnot, how have you found that the technology helps uh, speed along reporting or whatnot during those events? Yeah, so kind of the, the typical application that we, we use it for um, is what we do is we'll, at the beginning of the day, install an APRS tracker in each of our support and gear vehicles, in each of the ambulances or each of the fire trucks, or whichever vehicle resources we have allocated for the event. Um, and then in our dispatch center, you know, which you know, would be a net control, you know, for an am- a smaller amateur event would be, you know, your net control operator sitting underneath a pop-up. Um, but for some of the larger events I volunteer with, we've got whole um, rooms dedicated to kind of our, you know, net control, command and control system. We'll have a projector set up with a map of the course. And then each one of these resources that we put a tracker in end up as a little pinpoint on the map. Right. And so then when on the radio, you get a medical call from, hey, I'm at mile marker 15 and I've got a bicyclist down. All you have to do is you look up at the map and go, well, that ambulance number three is the closest one. Mm-hmm. Right. And so there's it, what it does is it saves you this kind of asking around for, well, you know, hey, ambulance one, where are you? And hey, ambulance two, are you over there? Um, you know, which one of you is closest? Um, you can just look at the map and go, oh, that one's the closest. Call them up. I'll get them to the to the event and, you know, then you're, you're off to the races. Right. And so it's not like APRS solves anything that you can't already solve on on voice communications. Right. You can ask everyone where they are or kind of keep track of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that APRS makes it so much easier. And so um, it's just it's, you know, so that I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to say it and uh, Bob Vernango would, would, you know, hate me for it. But the killer app for APRS is just this vehicle tracking system. Right. Every 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 article that Bob starts, he says it is not just a vehicle tracking system. <laughs> um, and he's right. It's not. But um, when you're looking at kind of this event support stuff, um, the vehicle tracking is, you know, 97 percent of the of the usefulness of it. Um, I also use um, when I set up like a remote radio site. Right. Because for some of these events, we'll deploy temporary repeaters with a solar panel and a car battery. And so. Um, putting, I'll also just kind of sneak in an APRS node there because APRS supports telemetry, hmm. right? And so I can sit there and from the comfort of the dispatch center, I can get a voltage reading off of the batteries and off of the solar panel um, and be able to see the state of the cooling fan um, because that, that sort of stuff is supported over the, the telemetry packet. So every 10 minutes it says, all right, this is my battery voltage. This is the fan, state of the fans. Like this radio site is good. Cool. Well, yeah. you know, and well, I'll, I'll give you a real life experience here. We just uh, back in October, early October, we had the Hurricane Matthew come up the coast of South mm-hmm. Carolina, and I was listening to our linked system rep- uh, repeater system here in South Carolina, and the guys down on the coast were out and about, kind of assessing what was going on during during the situation. And one guy called in. He said, "Hey, I'm I'm here at whatever, and whatever. I have a down tree." And they said, "We see you," which Alluded, alluded to the fact that he was being tracked via APRS. We see you, and we've got the coordinates. We'll pass that on to the local emergency management people. So that was really cool. I heard it. I knew what they were doing, and it was really neat to kind of be like, wow, that worked really quick and really good right there. I could see how well this could work on a bike race, a foot race, any type of event that amateur radio operators support. Oh, yeah, for sure, right? As I've um, A couple of years ago, one of our drivers actually got lost, um, at at the tri- wildflower triathlon, and the thing is, all of the roads out there, they're all dirt fire roads, mm. and so it's not like we've got signposts. And so they're like, they're saying they're like, I'm I'm in an intersection with five roads, I'm totally lost. And so we're, we're we we talked them back onto an asphalt road, just kind of looking at the map, like, okay, you're coming up to that intersection, you want to turn right there. Um, and so yeah, it's it's this great uh, the, this great ability to have. GPS locations given to you. Mm-hmm. Um, we're trying to, you're trying to read a, a raw GPS address uh, uh, coordinate off of, over the over the radio. Really is kind of miserable because you're sitting there like, well, well it was at an eight or a, a four, yeah. right? And so and there's just a lot of digits to it. And so that's where the packet radio really is valuable and just be able to puke all of this, you know, the string of numbers, and then you show up on the map. Yeah. And speaking of the map, guys, you can go right now to uh, APRS.fi. And check out what all's happening on APRS, not just yeah. in South Carolina. I mean, you can look at your county, your state, the nation, the world. Uh, you just pull around 
wherever you want to go, it's all there. Whatever's being reported to an eye gating device is showing up right now live on APRS dot Fox India. Oh yeah. Yeah. And kind of one, one thing that people do get a little confused about is APRS dot FI. It is, that isn't APERS, right? Is that is, yeah. that is just, um, one guy's website that happens to be tied into this fire hose. That is the APRS IS, you know, mm-hmm. kind of backhaul. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that was, that was written by a guy named Hezu out in Finland. Um, that, yeah, he, he just took, he collects all of the APRS traffic. He sticks it in a database and then overlays it onto Google Maps, and it's a really, really clean, great interface. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we come back, if we can, I want to talk a little bit about using APRS from your shack and why someone would want to do that and how to make that happen. If that's good with you. Yeah, sure. All right, we'll be back with Kenneth Finnegan, his call again, Whiskey 6 Kilo Whiskey Fox. He's good on QRZ. And we've got a lot of his uh, links on our show notes here, as well as some links to his videos on YouTube. Back in just a moment, Ham Radio 360 podcast. I think I can speak for George and Jeremy both that we adore hearing from our audience. It's always cool to catch up with you guys and to see what's going on. It's really exciting, too, when you get the emails. Hey, I was just licensed. I just passed my test. The reason I decided to get into ham radio was I found this podcast, and you guys inspired me. Thank you so much, and wow. How humbling is that? How cool is that? And and I've got a request for all you new guys and gals out there. If you've recently gotten your technician's license, let's say since December 1, 2016. Now, if you've been licensed between now and t- December the 1st, 2016, please message me, email, text, whatever. Email's preferred because I'm an older guy. Kale at hamradio360.com. If you're a new technician licensee, you've just gotten your tech license between December 1st and now, please email me. I've got some questions to ask you and maybe some ways that I can even help you. Kale at hamradio360.com. So we're back with Kenneth. And, uh, you know, I, I've said it, I don't probably too many times during this program, but I'm trying to get APRS working around here. One of the things I really want to be able to do is sit in my shack and look at a computer monitor and have it show me what's happening around me on APRS. And that's really not a big deal as it sounds, is it? No, that, that's exactly, you know, that's exactly what it was designed for. Right. And so um, the the easiest solution answer to that is, well, you know, you just pull up APRS at FI and you zoom in on wherever you are. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But, you know, I think at, at your place, you don't even have Internet access yeah. out in the middle of sticks nowhere. Yeah. Um, and so that's where APRS on the RF side really becomes valuable. Right. And so um, to kind of to, to get get someone started in APRS from a base station side, what you're looking at is you, you just have to find a spare VHF radio, um, to ideally one that's got nice interface pins on the back of it. So I think um, kind of I think I know partic- particularly Yezu, but a couple a couple of the radios uh, manufacturers have been trying to standardize on that little mini DIN six pin. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you you find one of those a VHF radio, you hook it up to antenna, um, you wire that up to a terminal node controller, um, and a lot of the terminal node controllers support this uh, mode called a Kiss mode. Um, KISS mode is kind of this binary transport where the terminal node controller doesn't do anything. And all it does is it streams all the packets back to your computer, um, and from your computer to the, the TNC. Um, so it just, it translates. Yeah. At that point, like it's, it's literally indistinct. Like it's, we're talking about like external dial up modem, Mm -hmm. right? Is it's, it's very, very similar where you, on an external dial up modem, you've got your computer, hooked up through a serial port to this little metal box. Um, and the little metal box on the other side goes out to whatever your channel is, right? In the, in the case of a dial-up external modem back in the day, um, that was a telephone line. And so it's, it's just that now instead of a telephone line, we're using, sorry, your VHF radio. Yeah. Right? And so then, all, so once you get that set up, at this point, you know, you can pick any, almost any APRS desktop software you want because they all speak the same KISS protocol, right? And so when you're, when you're downloading various applications online and trying them out, all you, need to, all you need to do to get it to talk to your radio is know your serial port and find where in the, in the software it says configure for a KISS serial port. And and this this doesn't have to be guys. Okay, now I've got to go buy another Windows 10 machine at Costco for seven hundred dollars. I mean, this is a thirty five dollar Raspberry Pi three. 
Oh yeah, yeah or two, right? because right because the 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 APRS network it's twelve hundred bits per second, right? <laughs> and so you're you're not going to overwhelm your computer um, with the voluminous data coming out of your local RF network, right? Uh, especially in Spartanburg, South Carolina, folks. <laughs> but exactly. That, that's a whole other discussion. Um, so that gives me RF an RF view of what's going on around me. Now I can set up my station here at the house with a, a TNC and a radio connected to a big stick antenna out in the yard. Yep. And, and I can push information out there for anybody who dri- who's driving up interstate 26 going from Charleston to Asheville. And I can let them know if I want to, Hey, uh, there's a wreck on 26 or I can let them know, Hey, local club repeater, one forty seven three one five. Uh, tone 123, come by and say, hey, or I could tell them I'm monitoring 146.52. I could tell them anything. And yeah. as, as they drive through, it's almost like an old cell phone, you know, as they drive through my cell or if they pick it up from another digipeter, they'll get that information displayed if they have a display type uh, connection in their vehicle. Yeah, right. And so that, that brings in a new APRS format that we haven't talked about yet, which is called objects. Okay. Right. And so um, the APRS location packets let you give your own GPS location, and then it gives you a little bit of space at the end to say a status message. So like I'm li- I- I'm listening on this frequency, or I'm having a great day, or whatever you want to say. Ham Radio 360 um, podcast is my favorite. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You could set up you could set up your tracker to say that. Um, and so, you know, every, so typically for like a base station, you'd be beaconing that every once every 10, 15 or 30 minutes saying just, this is my location. This is my status. Mm-hmm. But when you then want to start talking about these other abstract resources that are other places, um, in the network than where you are, um, you would put out what are called objects. And so an object packet comes out of your radio saying, all right, so Kale has beaconed this object that has this name, right? So you could, you know, call it, it's like um, a nearby object that I could beacon here would be like, I'm, I'm one of the trustees for the W6 TDM repeater. And so I could say the W6 TDM repeater is in this general location, right? And so if you want to give it an exact GPS location, you can do that. If you want to say that it's just in this vague vicinity, APRS supports that as well as you can give it you can give the location any level of um, certainty that you want. Okay. Um, and so you can say, in this vague vicinity is the W6 TDM repeater. Um, and it is on, and then there's a there's a specific format on APERS for frequencies, right? So you can specify it is on, you know, 440.150 megahertz. It has a positive 5 megahertz offset. It has a 100 hertz PL tone. Um, and so in the ideal case, um, and this is a feature that isn't really well tested. Um, anyone driving through and the, their radio, you know, their their Kenwood, you know, seven ten radio receives this packet. Ideally, what they should be able to do is just say, "Yeah, I want to go to that repeater." They can just click on it and it'll take it to them. Mm. It's not a well tested feature. Um, ironically, for someone who did his master's thesis on APRS, I own very relatively little off the shelf APRS gear. Um, so I've actually been like, I've, I, I horse trade with people that have spare Kenwoods and Yeezys. is like, Hey, can I borrow your radio for a few, few weeks? I need to do some testing on it. Um, and so it's not a well tested feature, but that's kind of the concept, right? And so if there was an accident that showed up, you could, um, depending on the software, it's a completely different interface for how you add them, but you can somehow add this new object that is for that other pinpoint that you want to put on people's maps. Nice. Yeah. So it's 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 an it's a continually evolving technology. Oh yeah, right. It's one of these things where um, the the standards committee, and that's a very generous term for what it is. Um, it's a, a bunch of us on a mailing list. Um, we're very adamant that you can do whatever you want with APRS, um, which has the disadvantage that um, there you'll see a lot of the documentation kind of deliberately not give you specific guidance on. Well, what routing path do you use, and what aliases should you respond to? Right. Um, but it gives you this great flexibility that if you want to run it as, if like if if for your group you only want to run it as a vehicle location system, you can just run it as a vehicle location system. If you want it to be this great local situational awareness system where you can advertise all the local repeaters and you can advertise where the you know the where the local monthly amateur radio club meeting happens, you can advertise that, right? So you can place a pinpoint for, hey, we've got a, you know, tonight we're doing our uh, club meeting. Golden right? Corral. 
right? Or you know, hey, every Sunday a bunch of us got, a bunch of us hams kind of just meet up at the local Denny's and you know have breakfast, right? right? That sort of thing. You can put that pinpoint on the map, um, and that APRS supports that, right? And so it, it's very it's a very very flexible um, protocol, which is kind of you know both the good and the bad of it. Well, let me ask you this because. Let's say somebody's like, oh, this is it. Kel has convinced me. Kenneth has told me what I need to know. I'm jumping in head first. I'm buying me a tracker. I'm putting it in the car, and I'm ready to go. Okay, so that's that's one person. We're going to hear that. We've kind of covered those guys pretty good. Uh, mm -hmm. What about the person who wants to maybe do a little something more in depth, and uh, they, they, they are aware that there's APRS in their area? Uh, would it be in their best interest to find someone that's involved in the local APRS network to help them set up their paths? And you can explain what a path is if you want to, uh, but help them get those things nailed down properly to match what happens in their local area. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, one, one of the difficulties of APRS is that it is so flexible that, um, most areas have kind of developed these local coordinating groups and kind of their, their own little special interests mailing lists. So like, uh, so like for example, for California, um, California is a very different beast when it comes to APRS than when, you, when you're out in the uh, Midwest or on the East Coast because we have these 5,000-foot mountains. And we have a digipeter on the top of a 5,000-foot mountain. You just don't need any more digipeters in the local area anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Right. And and it's one of those questions where like even even people in California will disagree with that statement I just made because it, it's a very it's a very sticky situation for how do you design your local network. Right. Right. And and so you'll you'll I cannot encourage people enough to find your local Elmers to kind of walk you through. Well, this is, you know, kind of and have them do a sanity check on, well, this is what you have set up. Like, is this does this make sense? Does this not make sense? Um, that sort of thing. Um, you're, you're going to get a lot of support at the local level for that. Um, so, you know, it's one of these things where, um, it's kind of a blessing and a curse when new hams get really excited about APRS and like they set up their own digipeter on top of their house because maybe three other guys have also gotten really excited about it and set up digipeters real close to that. Mm -hmm. And so you, you will get some sort of inner, you, you will get some kinds of interference there. And they're all right? running 75 watt, you know, Yesu 2900s or something. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Where, I mean, for APRS, you really, I, I wouldn't say that you need that much power. Mm -hmm. Right. So like I, on, on my trucks tracker, I, I only run, I have a little toggle switch that switches it between, uh, five and 15, 18 Watts. Um, right. And like 20 Watts is pretty high power for a digipeter. Um, in California in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like, you know, at, at most we're talking about like, maybe you're running your, your radio at medium or maybe at 50 Watts, um, at the, at the most. Yeah. Um, right. And so it's one of these things where you, you need to, if, if you want to get more into it, you start getting involved with a local working group, um, to set up the local infrastructure. And if you don't right? have one of those, you create it yourself. Yeah. Right. And so, um, like how we first started, the two of us first started talking about this was the fact that you have no APRS, almost no APRS coverage locally at all. Yeah. Right. And so, um, this kind of the, re the reason why you started talking to me is because, you know, while working on my master's thesis for this, um, for my master's thesis and all of these experiments I was running, I started using the, one of the Digipeter software packages called APRX, right? So that's Alpha Papa Romeo X-Ray. Mm -hmm. Um, APRX is a Linux based Digipeter software, right? And so it's designed so that you can take a terminal node controller in KISS mode and you can take, you know, even just a Raspberry Pi running, um, this APRX software and it'll act as a Digipeter, right? And so I actually, I, I started using that a lot and the guy who originally wrote it, Mati, um, he had this, you know, problem that, you know, real life is much more important than amateur radio, um, and so he had kind of let it, it kind of had, had, it was, it was suffering from a kind of a lack of ownership. And so I talked to him a few times and he's like, and, and he actually was um, more than happy to have me take over ownership, um, for maintaining APRX. Right. And so I'm, if, if you go look up APRX, I'm actually the, the current maintainer for it. Nice. Um, and so, uh, if you want, wanted to set up a digipeter, in an area, you could use APRX running on a Raspberry Pi or any sort of computer running Linux mm -hmm. um, and have it as acting as your local Digipeter or Internet Gateway. Which is sweet because just the other day here on Twitter, was it Twitter or Facebook? 
I think I think it was Twitter because you were there, and yeah. and someone mentioned, hey, if you're going to put up a, a dual band antenna for your UHF repeater, Kale, that's an excellent opportunity to put a I gate there at the fire station with your repeater, and run them at the same time on the same antenna. Oh yeah, yeah. As I I several times all the time I will set up a dual band uh, like an X50 diamond antenna yep. and drop it out to a diplexer because. All the repeat, all the all the repeaters I use are UHF, and so I, I drop the diplexer out, and I make sure I have I have one radio that's sitting on my UHF repeater, and I make sure not to tune it to VHF <laughs> because the VHF side of the diplexer is going into an APRS internet gateway. So th- what what we're saying here, folks, is in addition to the K4 CDN repeater, we're going to put Kel's going to put, and I'm going to beg Kenneth to help me uh, put an <laughs> eye gate there as well for uh, APRS. And, and you know that's that's the awesome thing about an audience and having and you know this from YouTube, uh, you get some of the best ideas from the people you surround yourself with, and I mean you talk about out of the blue, it's like well, I never even considered that, and I've got the X fifty antenna here to go mm-hmm. to go up for the repeater. And yeah, I, I, man, I didn't cross my mind. Now I got to buy a diplexer, which will probably happen after this phone this call today. Oh yeah, yeah, right. And, and, and MFJ makes a pretty pretty decent one that's only about thirty dollars. Cool. Um, right, and so like the, the diplexers are are in the scope of the filtering costs that you already have for a repeater. Um, it ends up being real attractive. Nice, nice. So that's you know again here here we're talking other projects on the 360 show, but just kind of showing you an additional uh, means of integrating this type of APRS technology into something that you may already have just sticking out there on the tower or the side of the house. You got a dual band antenna. Uh, you're a UHF guy like me, so you've got all these you know this freedom to to use VHF for this APRS thing. Kenneth, what have we forgotten? to share with people about APRS. Oh God, we could go on for two or three more hours about the minutia of APRS. Well, we may need to come back and do a follow-up show in all sincerity, because I think that more than likely this is going to just spur more questions, which is always great because I always like to continue learning. Oh, right. And it's, and, 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 and you said it at the beginning is it's real hard. Um, those of us that are on the kind of the standards committee and that really focus on developing kind of the new conventions for APRS um, we we're kind of lost out in the weeds as far as the protocol, and so when someone new comes on and is confused about the funnel par- fundamental parts of APRS, um, I I will admit that we aren't very good at presenting it, mm. right? And so like if if someone were to ask right now, well, what website do I go to for a good introduction to APRS? I would have to admit there really isn't one. Yeah, right. And so yeah, is we will. I, I fully expect people in the audience to send in lots and lots of really great questions mm-hmm. that we we just kind of glossed over because you know the two of us have already talked about APRS for a couple hours. I, I live in this stuff. I spend several hours a week writing emails and spe- and documents about it. Um, he so wrote, yeah, he I wrote think his master's thesis on it, folks. <laughs> I mean, yeah, right. I mean, I, I wrote my master's thesis and I still put out a, you know couple uh, one or two pages of documentation on it per month. Yeah. Um, as as we're kind of continuing to suss out. Uh, these little ambiguities. Um, right, so, so right after I finished my master's thesis, like any good graduate student, I dropped APRS and didn't touch it for a year and a half because <laughs> once you've written a thesis on something, you just don't want anything to do with it. Yep. Um, so I gave it a year to kind of just sit over in the corner and cool off. Um, but you know, in the last year or so, I've kind of been getting back into it and really, you know, kind of get, I've gotten real active on the mailing list and I'm, I'm working on kind of just really f- starting to write more of these little snippet articles so, so that like, you know, if you wanted to learn about telemetry, I think there needs to be a good repository somewhere where I can have lots and lots of articles for, this is how the telemetry system works. This is how the frequency specs work. Right. And I think, I think all, all of these little pieces of the protocol can always be improved with better documentation. Well, you know, and, and the thing about it is, it, it's th- this conversation, our previous conversation, it's a further example of this hobby and how, like I have said it so many times, been involved in multiple hobbies throughout my adult life, and not one have I found that has been so giving and and so welcoming to someone who has questions and needs answers, and you know, and although there's not a lot of quest- not a lot of answers to your questions floating around on the internet out there right now of APRS. Uh, We're going to continue to address this and going in right now, going to hit and uh, invite Kenneth back for a follow-up show potentially after the first of the year to talk more about APRS. 
as, as I continue my projects here, myself, David, uh, Gary, Andy, uh, William, Polito, we've been working uh, for, for two years, and, and we're, we're at that tipping point. We're at the pinnacle where we're ready to start running down the hill without our helmets on uh, to get this thing running. So, um, Kenneth, man, thank you so much for sharing with us about APRS and uh, taking your time to be here with us on the program. We thank you for listening to the show. We're so excited that uh, we know at least one person went to Pacificon last year and uh, learned about our show and, and came back and, and has been listening and now participating. So thank you, man. We really appreciate you being here. Oh, yeah. I'm really happy to be here. I, I, I enjoy it. And again, we'll have links to Kenneth's videos, his YouTube channel, uh, probably some, some links to other things that he believes you will find of interest and help as well. So make sure you check out our show notes. They're there every episode, and we talk about it, and you may or may not realize the amount of information that's there. It's not a bunch of kill writing stuff. It's the links. It's, where, it's pointing you where you're looking to go. So if you're wanting to learn more about this topic and others that we've covered in the past, remember to visit hamradio360.com. Kenneth, his call is Whiskey 6, Kilo Whiskey Fox. Thanks again, man. So, so much appreciate you being here with us. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, as far as following me online, um, you know, you mentioned Twitter a little bit, but I'm real active on Twitter, okay. um, you know, at KWF. And then um, if people want to read kind of more of my longer form rantings and blogging stuff, um, I also, I, you know, most of my YouTube videos really are not so much just YouTube videos, but they're, they're videos to be dropped onto my blog um, at blog.thelifeofkenneth.com. Cool, cool. We'll have those linked there for sure in the show notes. And again, thank you for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you. So do you feel better about APRS? I mean, really, are, did, is that show, did it make you like... <sighs> just a big sigh of relief. I know it did for me. Now, granted, I've had, I had the two hour private conversation with Kenneth, but, uh, really wanted to cover those bases that he and I did on the phone, not necessarily specific to what Kel's trying to do here in the upstate of South Carolina, but to help us all get a good grasp of this thing that seems so elusive on the backside. And really it's not. And I hope that this show has done what we intended for it to do, and that is to make it easy to understand APRS and everything involved. Now, again, I want to remind you, hamradio360.com, that's our home base. That's where all of our show notes are, our podcast episodes, the workbench. We have uh, content creators listed there that are pushing their we got blogs. We have RSS feeds for the podcast. A lot of it's there at hamradio360.com. So if we went too fast today or maybe you're listening in the car, you can't remember, hamradio360.com will get you back to what we've been talking about here on Ham Radio 360. Now, I want to again say thank you to Kenneth, who is Whiskey 6, Kilo Whiskey Fox. Man, thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, I need some more help. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. But, Kenneth, really appreciate you coming on, man. The show was great. The information was awesome. We could probably do another program, and we probably will as a follow-up as we continue to learn more about APRS. Hey, don't forget our friends at Ellacraft.com. It's Hands On Ham Radio. If you're needing a KX2, KX3, a K3S, some of those phenomenal rigs that you can take out in the field, maybe you can leave them in the shack. They're all there at Ellacraft.com. And if you decide to head over that way, which we hope you do, Please let them know that you heard about them here on Ham Radio 360. I appreciate you guys listening. Thank you so much. It's always our pleasure to be here with you. We can't wait every week. Winterfield Day is coming up. I'm sure we'll have some uh, follow-up on that on a very, uh, very soon coming show. Workbench is next week. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for listening. 73, y'all. Thank you for listening to Ham Radio 360, brought to you by mtcradio.com. For more information about the program, visit hamradio360.com. Till next time, 73s, y'all.